Okay, folks, welcome to week 16 of quantum field theory. And today, so the last few weeks, we've sort of taken a detour into some modern techniques, right? So we looked at modern scattering amplitude techniques, i.e. spinner helicity, and we saw a very nice sort of mathematical story being written down that took our language of momentum space scattering amplitudes into this like massless regime and gave us some really nice compact expressions for what otherwise would be really long expressions. Then the week after last week, we looked at aspects of conformal field theory, which utilizes the special symmetry of conformal symmetry and sort of recasts all of the aspects of quantum field theory into sort of a different framework. Uh, the language of S matrices and Feynman rules turns into the language of correlation functions and operator valued expressions. So we took a little detour. I just wanted to give you a little flavor of those subjects. Obviously, conformal field theory and scattering amplitudes are a whole subject to themselves, right? And so uh, we will certainly dive deeper into aspects of both. So today, I thought, let's go backwards and let's start with very basic principles and let's develop the importance of gauge invariance, okay? You've heard this term a lot. You hear this term, gauge symmetry, gauge invariance, gauge theory, blah, 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 blah. But why do we use it? Why do we need it? Why is it important? Hopefully, my hope is that a lot of this is review for you uh, because, uh, uh, not review for the people that are just joining us, the, the, the extra person, but review for all of the rest of us, because you should have read a lot of these kinds of things or been, uh, been introduced to them. But I think it would be useful for me to really tell you why we need gauge theory, why we need gauge symmetry, why do we insist on it? Why is it such a powerful technique? And I think it will provide an excellent sort of precursor to talking about QCD which is sort of an extension of Yang-Mills theory. Yang-Mills theory is just a non-abelian gauge theory, right? Okay, so let's begin, very basic, ready? This is the most complicated equation I'm gonna write on the board today. So we start with this, okay. So, okay, write Newtonian mechanics. We have standard Newtonian mechanics, F equals MA, you can write down all of the kinematics, you can write down all of the dynamics, you can write down all of the aspects of any system starting there. Okay, we're good. Okay, no explanation needed. Now we know that if I have conservative forces, I can write down F, sorry, as equal to minus the gradient of the potential, right? That's also familiar. And so if I just write this out, then I have some M D B D T equals minus the gradient of u. Okay, so this is the kind of basic thing. And we know that there's another very powerful formulation of mechanics that is actually kind of amazing that it works, but also intuitively plausible that it works, i.e. the Lagrangian formalism, where I can write down something called the Lagrangian as a function of the kinetic and potential energy, right? So that's what I define the Lagrangian as, where T is usually just like, usually just goes one half mv squared, right? The kinetic energy. Okay. And we know when we've derived these equations before, so I'm not gonna, you can look at previous lectures if you need some review, but we know that we can now solve the Euler-Lagrange equations. So I'm just gonna write them down, but this should be review, so del, uh, actually, that needs a, sorry, it's a total derivative. Uh, so DDT del L del Q dot, Q dot I equals del L del QI. Okay, so this should be review because we've derived these, we've used these many, many times. Okay, and even, I think Isha has seen some basic applications of this, good, okay. We derived it yesterday. Sorry? I derived it yesterday. <laughs> oh, good. Excellent. So there you go. So you used an action, right? You derived this from an action, you vary the action. Good. Okay. So Q dot I and QI are what you, we call generalized coordinates, right? So I can use this for any coordinate system. 
and I just turn the crank and solve the euler Lagrange equation. So let's do a really quick example. Okay. So let's do the example for just a standard free particle, right? Moving through space. So if I have a free particle, if I take del L, del Q dot one, and we'll, uh, of, uh, we'll, we'll say the Lagrangian then is what? What would be the Lagrangian for a free particle? Can someone tell me? We'll just do a very basic, we've done this before, so. So the Lagrangian would just be one half M X dot squared minus some U, right? Any potential, right? I, I don't specify. This is just some function of X, right? So what would be del L del Q dot? Someone tell me. Or this should really be del L del X dot because now I, I don't have generalized coordinates. Now I have uh, one variable that I've defined. So what's del, del X dot? Isha, you did this yesterday. So what's del L del X dot? I'm gonna look through my notes one. Why? Just look at the Lagrangian. You just take the derivative of this, right? Because this is the only term with X dot dependence. So it would be, it would be just two X dot. <laughs> Well, two times a half, right? So mx dot. Mx dot. So this is just mx dot, right? And then what would be del L del x? Well, that would just be the derivative of u, right? So we'll just call that nominal u because it's just some derivative of u. Or actually, since this is with respect to x, we should really just write down du dx right? because that's one component. Okay, so now I take the total derivative of del L del Q dot, so that gives me MX double dot. Actually, this is a minus sign. So this is a, this is a, a, this is a plus sign in the derivative. So then I get MX double dot minus DU DX. No, this should be a plus DU DX, right? Because this is a minus sign. So I get a minus out there when I take that derivative. And then I can move this over and I just get MX double dot equals minus du dx, which is exactly this equation up here, right? For the x component of the force. So this is just saying that fx equals minus du dx, right? Because uh, we have that f equals minus the gradient of u, right? That's for all three components. Okay, this is review. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna just pretend that this is straightforward. Because remember, I, I don't remember, I think it might be quantum mechanic. It was in the quantum mechanics course. We went through a deep dive of this, right? We did it for polar, we did, we did it for all sorts, and then we derived the path integral. That was the whole motivation. So I just want to show you this for just quick review. I'm not going to do anything else, but basically the big takeaway is we have another formulation of classical mechanics that's very powerful, right? In which we only use energies. Okay, good. So let's move on then. This was obviously a classical story, right? We start with some classical equations, uh, classical system, we write down the energies and then we write down equations in motion. That's the whole name of the game. Now what happens in quantum field theory, right? We take the same ideas and now what are, what are the dynamical objects of interest? Well, they are our quantum fields, right? Phi, psi, spinner fields, i.e. any kind of field that describes some kind of particle. Okay, and so now we can easily write down the generalization of Euler-Lagrange in the following way. So first of all, we have, remember, we have, this should be straightforward, we have our space-time derivatives. So we have d mu phi i. So now we're taking the space-time derivative of phi. And so this is just what? d phi i over dx mu, right? This is just a space-time derivative. And so now we can write down the Euler-Lagrange equations in a very straightforward way. We have d mu del L del d mu phi, Right, so the left side now just becomes a function of the same kind of Lagrangian that we're gonna to have to write down. 
except now we're taking space time derivatives of the field, right? And then this is just equal to simply del L del phi L. Okay, so we know this equation too. We've seen it, we've used it. Okay, so remember the most basic Lagrangian we used was scalar field theory. So for scalar field theory, the Lagrangian is one half d mu phi d mu phi plus one half m squared phi squared, right? That's the basic skip. Sorry, there should be a minus. Right. And from this, if you solve Euler Lagrange, remember we get the Klein Gordon equation d squared plus m squared equals zero. Right. So this is the very uh, basic thing that we've used many times. Sorry, d squared m squared phi equals zero. Right. Okay. So that's the Klein Gordon equation. That's for spin zero. So I'm going fast because we've seen all of this before, right? So if something's confusing, let me know. But I'm, I'm kind of going because I want to get to the big picture kind of quick. So, and we've also seen this Lagrangian. We've also written down the Lagrangian for Dirac fields, right? So that's just I psi bar gamma mu d mu, sorry, psi minus m psi bar psi. Right? So that's the Dirac Lagrangian. And from this, you use Euler Lagrange and you get the Dirac equation. Right? So, what's the Dirac equation? It's just I gamma mu d mu psi minus m psi. Right? And then you'll have another Dirac equation for psi bar. Right? You'll have the adjoint equation. Everyone okay with all of this? We've seen all of this. This is not regular. anything kind of new. Okay. Okay, and you can, and we've also seen Lagrangians with vector fields, right? A, a mu's and a mu's, right? So let's write down a Lagrangian for vector fields. So uh, this is called the Proca Lagrangian in, in a lot of places. So if I write down the Lagrangian for vector fields, I can write it as the following. So minus one over 16 pi. Uh, d mu a mu minus d mu a mu times then just the lower indices. This should be a very recognizable thing that I just wrote down. Plus one over eight pi m squared a mu a mu. Does anyone recognize what these two guys are? So this is, so I've written down a Lagrangian now for a spin one vector field, right? So this is spin one half, this is spin zero, this is spin one. But does anyone recognize what these two guys are? Weren't they from the Lagrangian that we did a little while ago, like for- Right, right. Right, right, exactly. So these are just uh, the field strength tensors, right? F mu nu. So I can rewrite this Lagrangian in the following way for spin one. I can rewrite this Lagrangian like this. I can write this down as Lagrangian equals one over 16 pi f mu nu f mu nu plus one over eight pi m squared. So this is my Lagrangian for spin one. This should look very familiar to you, right? It almost looks like ENM, right? It looks very similar to the Maxwell Lagrangian, uh, right? And if you solve the equation of motion, so you solve Euler Lagrange, you get that the equation of motion is d mu f mu nu plus m squared a mu equals zero. And recall in classical electromagnetism, a nu, this is a massless vector field, right? The photon is massless. So the field that describes the photon is a massless vector field. So this equation actually just becomes d nu, f mu nu equals zero, which is exactly the Maxwell equation, right? So this is just the Maxwell equation. So basically uh, you can get the Maxwell Lagrangian just by, uh, sorry, you can get the Maxwell equation just by writing down this sort of spin one Lagrangian. Okay. 
Isha, this is probably not familiar to you, but your big takeaway should just be, just know what a Lagrangian basically is. Just some kinetic and potential term. Although in quantum field theory, that analogy doesn't really, it kind of does, right? Because you have some kinetic term that doesn't really hold up, but the potential term is really sometimes like an interaction term. So it kind of holds up, but not, not entirely. Okay, so let's move on. So uh, let's write down the following. Okay, so that was a quick review. So now I wanna go to uh, the new stuff. Okay, so let's write down the following. Uh, actually, let's do one more Lagrangian. Let's do a Lagrangian with a source. So we have one over 16 pi, F mu nu, F mu nu, minus J mu A mu. Right. This would be a Lagrangian with a source term. Sorry, J mu A mu should be an inner product. Okay, this would be some current or some source J, right? And we know that current source is the electric field. Current is also conserved, right? Okay. So if I solve uh, Euler Lagrange, I just get D mu F mu nu equals uh, what fraction? I'm going to get out here. Uh, right, 4 pi j. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so this is just an equation of motion now. So it's the same Maxwell equation, d mu f mu nu, but now it's some source term j nu, some source current, right? So I just, you know. And we know because of Noether's theorem that d mu j mu equals zero, right? The current's conserved. Okay, now let's get to the new stuff. Let me know when I can erase. I'm going fast because this is kind of review. Okay, can I erase? Okay. Okay, very good. Okay, so let me make some comments now before we get to the new stuff. So, it seems, well, it doesn't seem, we know, sorry, also, I, you know, I got my vaccine a few days ago, so much like Jenna, I was really sick yesterday, like, I, I felt terrible, now I feel good all of a sudden, so I don't know, I feel like this vaccine is a one-day thing, but I'm still a little slow, so if I make mistakes, please point, point them out, but I feel much better today, but it, so what I was saying, it doesn't seem as if it is true that the fundamental starting point in quantum field theory is a Lagrangian, right? You write it down, that's your theory. It has interaction terms. It maintains Lorentz invariance. It has certain symmetries that we want to impose. Now the question is, well, before I tell you the question, we also know that symmetry seems to be a very nice guiding principle for organizing things. And you're gonna see this even deeper when I talk to you about QCD. Literally, Murray Gelman said, I want to fill out a certain representation. Now you know what representation means because of Johnson's lectures. So literally Murray Gelman said, I want to fill out a certain rep representation of a group. And in doing so, he discovered that there must be three quarks, that they must have color charge. You know, like it's incredible that just by saying, look, I need all of the structure of the group to be filled out, you get all of the corresponding physics that nature actually uh, uh, imposes. That's kind of miraculous, right? It's like uh, if someone, if, if a physicist sat down and said, this mathematical structure must be true, and somehow nature agrees with that. That's kind of how this worked. So you take your fundamental object of the Lagrangian and you ask yourself the following question. You say, how far can I, or do I wanna push the idea of symmetry? That's the question. And initially, so what I'm gonna show you, there's really no, there is, so, okay. There is a rhyme or reason as to why we do impose this symmetry. Right, because it from this symmetry we, we will be able to describe all of the residual physics, 
But ultimately, there's no reason why nature demands these symmetries, right? These are mathematical objects or mathematical manifestations. But initially, when people ask themselves this question, how far do we want to push the symmetry? Okay. When initially people asked themselves this, it wasn't, at least when theorists asked themselves this, right? It wasn't exactly clear as to what this was going to lead to. Uh, it almost felt too general, okay? So actually, I'm going to show you yang Mills theory today, and I'm going to show you the basic symmetry off of which all of the standard model is based on. But actually, what's funny is when Yang and Mills wrote their paper on this symmetry, it was very general. In fact, it really didn't describe anything physical at all, right? Yang and Mills did not write the Lagrangian for QCE, right? They wrote a very generalized version of a non-abelian gauge theory. Okay, no one expected this to actually work for anything physical, but it did. But what I'm, what I'm trying to stress to you is they just started with the simple question, what if we start with, how, sorry, they started with a simple question, how far can we push the idea of symmetry? Okay. And the symmetry that they demanded was local gauge invariance, which we know kind of basically from QED. Right, QED, we used global U1 invariance, right? So let's review that. So let's write down, Let's write down the Dirac Lagrangian as our starting point. So I psi bar gamma mu d mu psi minus m squared psi bar psi. Okay, this is the Dirac Lagrangian. No interactions, it's just a free Lagrangian, right? It, there's nothing going on here. Okay, so. This Lagrangian has a global symmetry, a global phase symmetry, right? If I send psi, can someone tell me what a global phase symmetry is or do I need to remind them? What am I gonna send psi to? Just some E to the I theta psi, right? or this side will go to some e to the i minus e to the i theta sidebar for the adjoint, right? So that's a global phase symmetry or a local, oh, sorry, a global gauge symmetry. What do I mean by that? So e to the i phi, phi uh, e to the i phi theta, e to the i theta multiplied by psi, well, theta is just a phase. And so what this symmetry is saying, it's some global gauge symmetry. Let's say I have a vector field, right? A bunch of vectors, okay? That's what psi represents. It's just a bunch of vectors in some field. And now I enact e to the i theta on psi. Well, that's a global gauge symmetry because all I'm doing is I'm taking all of the vectors and rotating them all at the same time by the same amount. So that leaves this guy invariant, right? Because we know that coordinates are completely arbitrary. If I take everything and rotate them by this much, the physics stays the same, right? I just start in some new reference, some new coordinate system. And this is a U1 symmetry because phase transformations are part of the U1 gauge group. Why? One, it's a one-dimensional group, U1, right? And these are unitary transformations, okay? Okay, so we know that QED is a U1 gauge theory, right? That's the basic idea. Okay, so how do I make this gauge transformation local, right? We've also discussed this. Well, now psi goes to the e to the i theta of x times psi. So now theta is actually a function of x. That's what I mean when I say I'm promoting the global gauge symmetry to a local one. Now, each vector can rotate by some different phase. Okay, so now I might have a new configuration entirely, and that's non-trivial because now the physics is different, okay? Now each vector can rotate independently at a different phase because I've made theta some function of x. Now you say, why doesn't this leave the Lagrangian invariant? Well, because remember, any Lagrangian is gonna have derivatives in it, right? It should, okay? So now if, I take d mu of e to the i theta psi, right? Because usually I have like d mu psi, right? But now I'm going to enact this phase transformation. Well, actually, let's do it for the global one. 
uh, for the local one. See, if I take d mu of the global transformation, this should be a i. If I take the derivative of the global gauge transformation, this is trivial, right? Because theta has no x dependence, right? So nothing is going to change. This is so, right? So if I just take d mu e to the i theta without the x of psi, this is trivial, right? I'm just taking the derivative of psi because this guy does not contribute to that derivative, right? There's no x dependence at all. But now that I've added in the x dependence, it's a local gauge transformation. So let's work out this derivative. And this is not going to leave the Lagrangian invariant. That's the whole, that's the whole point. So then I get what? I use the chain, the product rule. I get i d mu theta e to the i theta of x plus d mu e to the i theta of x psi, something like that. Wait a second, no. Like that. Because remember, this psi has x dependence, right? Psi is a, a spinner field. So psi is some function of x and t. So of course, when you differentiate it, you're going to get some, something back out. OK, so this is a problem, right? Because now local gauge invariance does not leave the Lagrangian invariant, right? If I just use this, the Lagrangian stays the same. No problem. You take the derivatives all day, right? Now, if I do it with a local gauge transformation, the Lagrangian's not invariant. I pick up this garbage term. I pick up extra junk, OK? This is what we call gauge redundancy, right? These are just redundancies. OK, now you say, is that clear to everyone? Can they see that? Why now my Lagrangian is different now if I use local versus global? Is that OK? OK. Don't say yes if it's, if it's really not, because this is kind of pivotal. Are we sure? OK. OK, good. OK, but now you ask me the following kind of like good question. You say, Kyle, why do we need local gauge in marriage? Who cares? Who cares? You know, big deal. Why, why do we? And you'll see why. But that, but that would be the right line of thinking. OK, so the first thing we should ask ourselves is, how do we fix this, right? How do we maintain local gauge invariance? Because obviously, we've broken it, right? We've broken it because we've introduced this term, OK? And that has added all of this junk. So you should know how we fix it. We have to add something called what? A covariant derivative, right? And that's going to cancel out this extra junk. So let's do that really quick. Right, so now my Lagrangian is not invariant. Let's just write this down. Now my Lagrangian goes to the Lagrangian minus an extra term, minus a term that goes d mu theta psi bar gamma mu psi. Right, so now I have this extra junk I have to take care of. Okay, so let me define this quantity lambda of x in the following way. So I define lambda of x as some one over q theta of x. You'll see why. Actually, I think I need a minus sign. Okay, so I just define something like that. And so now if I just use this weird definition, you'll see why I'm doing it. I get some L plus some extra term now. That goes q times q psi bar gamma mu psi. D mu lambda. Is this okay if I just use this definition for lambda? Now this is my extra junk term. Everyone okay with that? Let me just write it up top. because this will set up the problem. So the basic problem now is I have the Lagrangian that now goes to some Lagrangian plus Q psi bar gamma mu psi mu lambda 
the lambda is just minus one over Q. Data of X. Okay, excellent. Okay, so now my local gauge transformation can be written as psi goes to e to the minus q lambda of x psi. That's what I can rewrite the local transformation. Uh, isn't lambda here positive one over q times theta of x? Isn't lambda positive? Why would it be positive? Or from an earlier definition, you mentioned lambda of x is. Oh, no, 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 no. It should be minus. It should be minus. I thought I added the minus sign. It should be minus. Oh, yeah, I think earlier we were supposed to use a minus there. Yes, yes. Yeah. Because then you wouldn't get this plus sign here. Yeah. Yes, good. Okay, so now you say to yourself, I demand local gauge invariance, okay? So let's try and work this out. So now I just, that was just some notational stuff. Now let's get to the crux of it. So now let me go back. So I write down this Lagrangian. So what is my basic Lagrangian I'm working with? Right, so it's just the Dirac Lagrangian. So I psi bar, gamma mu, d mu, psi. Right? Basic uh, Dirac Lagrangian minus m, Psi bar psi. Okay. And now I write down the residual term as minus q. Okay. So this is going to be the, the way I get rid of this. Psi bar gamma mu psi times now the term a nu times some residual term. Sorry, we'll use mu here. So now I'm coupling the residual term. I'm coupling the residual term to this field in essence. We know what this is, right? This is just the gauge field, right? What we call the gauge field. And what my, my hope is I'm gonna define this field in such a way that when a local gauge transformation acts on it, it cancels out the redundant term, okay? So how does this field transform under local gauge transformations, we'll write down that a mu transforms as some a mu plus d mu lambda. And so then if this term comes out of a mu, it's gonna cancel that other redundancy, right? So all I've done to impose local gauge invariance is now I picked up an extra a mu defined in this way with the transformation law defined in this way. So we have now a locally invariant Lagrangian, but what is the cost? The cost is we picked up some vector field which couples to psi, which we've seen, right? Because that's QED. And now you should be like, wait a second, a mu has a special property. Okay. So now I'm showing you how this comes directly from imposing gauge invariance. You get a field that couples to psi, an extra field, if you want local gauge invariance in the first place. Isha might have been there in the 40s going, I don't want local gauge invariance. I'm sure many people said it. Well, then you wouldn't have this weird thing come out, you see. Okay, now we also need a free term to describe a mu. Okay, now a mu is its own dynamical thing. So we need a free term in the Lagrangian to describe a mu. So what would be a good term to describe a vector field? the vector Lagrangian, right? That would be a good good kind of thing to describe uh, a mu. So let's write it down again. And let's work out some of the properties of a mu. So this is the mass of the particle corresponding to the vector field. 
uh, what would it be? MA squared, I think. Yeah. So first of all, F mu nu, so the field strength, so the field strength So let's take this piece by piece. First of all, I want to make sure that this Lagrangian now, the free Lagrangian for this extra vector field is invariant under this transformation law. It has to be, right? That's the whole idea. Now you can check that F mu nu is invariant under this. So if I let A mu go to A mu plus D mu lambda, F mu nu stays invariant. Okay, good. You check that. This term does not stay invariant, actually. Okay. And this is a very easy check. So the only way we can keep gauge invariance, local gauge invariance, even after this prescription, is if I get rid of this term, i.e., this new vector field must be massless, which we know is true because the photon is massless. Okay. So it's again, all we're doing now is we are demanding symmetry and we're just following our nose and we're getting the answers that we want. Well, no, we don't know that we want that. We're kind of, we don't know if this is an all encompassing picture, but it's certainly starting to seem that way. So the gauge field must be massless. That's the big takeaway now. So gauge field is massless. Okay. So that's what we impose. And actually, we know that that's OK, because that's how it works in QED. The photon, the gauge field that describes the photon, is a massless vector field. OK? OK, can I erase the board? OK, good. Okay, so let's write down the final thing. So this is the gauge fixed QED Lagrangian. So the gauge fixed Lagrangian, we'll call it LGF. Now this is gauge fixed. Is just the Dirac Lagrangian. I'm not gonna write it out again. Minus the Maxwell Lagrangian. Right, just minus uh, just one sixteenth f mu nu f mu nu minus q psi bar gamma mu psi. So that's some interaction term that now couples to a mu. So a mu is just some electromagnetic potential or just some coupling term. Okay. Great. Okay, so we can write down a current, another current from this, just using the basic equations we've learned before that goes Q psi bar gamma mu psi. That's why I introduced that lambda because now we can just write down some charge Q. It just comes up from, from the basic story. So the big takeaway, Local gauge invariance gives us the full description of QED. Okay, that's what we've just shown. We, I just wrote down this is the QED Lagrangian, right? This is this is it. And local gauge invariance gives us the full story. That's kind of miraculous. It, it's actually kind of uh, see, but now okay, at this stage in the game, you say you know when people were figuring this out. Schwinger, Tamanaga, Feynman, and so on. It was kind of like, okay, this is fine. You see, U1 is a fine group. U1 is a bit trivial, right? It's some one dimensional group, who cares, right? It's just basically like multiplying by some complex number, right? E to the I theta is just some complex number. It's just a phase. Uh, and so like, 
if you multiply all the vectors by some complex number, who cares? That seems to be a bit of a trivial invariance. And adding all this extra stuff seems a little bit kind of annoying. You know, you have all these redundancies and, and all of this kind of thing. But when Yang and Mills wrote this paper, which I'm about to show you, uh, the basic idea, I went back and actually looked at Yang and Mills's original paper. And uh, I was actually surprised at how general it actually was. And I'm actually kind of surprised people figured out the QCD Lagrangian from that principle. It's kind of amazing. Okay. Let's just do one more thing. So remember, you could gauge fix in this way, but actually the base, the, the best way to do it is to introduce something called the gauge covariant derivative, right? Which is what we've done. So let's just write it down in that formalism as well. Okay, so now d mu psi goes to the following. So now if I take the derivative of psi in this locally gauge invariant way, I get e to the minus i q lambda. d mu minus i q d mu lambda. Okay, and now I just define this capital D mu as the gauge covariant derivative. Sorry. D mu plus I Q lambda. That's how I define the gauge covariant derivative. And so now if I take the gauge covariant derivative or just the covariant derivative of, of, of psi, I get that this goes to e to the minus iq lambda d mu psi in the local, uh, if this is a local gauge transformation, right? So then this d mu just has this extra stuff which cancels out the redundancy, this iq lambda. This should be similar to the covariant derivative from gr, right? Where we pick up an extra term. Actually, you should be now kind of intuitively thinking this, you know, GR is a gauge invariant theory. It's locally gauge invariant, actually. So get, actually GR, general relativity, programs local gauge invariants from the start. And it actually does that out of necessity, right? Because we've seen that if you go along some curved path, well, then the vector's changing as it goes along the curved path, right? So you already need some extra stuff to account for that. So GR actually ironically programs this in from the beginning. So this was understood by people, this, this whole procedure. It wasn't sort of a difficult thing to figure out because people had studied this in the context of GR. Okay, so any questions for me? This should all, yeah, go ahead, sorry. When you're using the covariant derivative, how is it local if it's not a function of x? How is it local if it's not a function of x? It's a fun, it has this lambda term, right? Remember lambda was oh. different. Oh, right, 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 yes. Right, yeah, good. So this proceed, so this should actually for the folks that have been in the course, this should kind of be review. We've done all of this actually to some extent. What we haven't done is SU2, which is Yang Mills, which is what I'm about to show you. So as we know, actually from QED, I've told you this, sending d mu to the covariant derivative, this procedure is called minimal coupling. Okay, so this is the minimal coupling prescription, which actually I think Lancaster Blundell even talk about in their chapter on gauge invariants. They talk about minimal coupling. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention this. The homework is in the research document. Okay, this, yeah, yeah. I put some reading in there. I, Jenna asked me about reading. I said, yeah, just because I'm gonna make you look at experiments, we're not ditching theory now, come on. <laughs> okay. So there was one very important figure in sort of the study, in sort of the uh, study of group theory as it pertains to physics. His name was Herman Weil, who Johnson should have mentioned. If he didn't, shame on him, I'll, I'll tell him after. So uh, Herman Weil was a very famous mathematician, and he really formulated the ideas of group theory in physics in probably the year 1918, from what I was able to find. 
And I actually looked at some of his original papers. They're really interesting. It's always interesting. See, you should always, as students of physics, you should look back at the original papers, right? That's why I made you read Schwinger's original paper of calculating the magnet, because they were figuring it out. You know, when you look at it in the textbook, it's like the full story, it's done, right? But when you look at it in, in sequence, like when I looked at the Yang Mills paper, and I'm actually gonna show you exactly what they wrote down. I think it's instructive, actually. It's not gonna be completely smooth, but that's how physics works. Okay, so let me just uh, put down a few more expressions. So first of all, this whole U1 gauge invariance is a unitary transformation. I can have any unitary transformation, it will leave psi invariant. Any, any, any unitary transformation will be globally gauge invariant. Okay, right, and what's unitarity? U dagger U equals one. Right, so if you take U dagger U, the Hermitian conjugate. And for U1, well then the unitary transformation is E to the I theta. So this is just a U1 transformation. Okay, I just wanted to make that explicit. We know in quantum mechanics the importance of unitarity. In fact, actually, I see, see, it's, see, quantum mechanics also comes from symmetry. Not actually, not like this, but symmetry is important in quantum mechanics. Symmetry is important in all aspects of physics, but very explicitly in, 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 in this stuff. Okay, let's talk about now. So basically what you can say is now we've worked out the U1 case. So let's go up a level, okay? Let's go up a level and let's talk about Yang Mills theory. Okay. So Yang Mills wanted to write down the locally gauge invariant theory for SU2. QCD is an SU3 gauge theory. Okay. And the weak interaction, so the weak interaction is really you can really say that it was really written down by three guys, Sheldon Glashow, Steven Weinberg, and Abdus Salam, GIS, no, Glashow, GSW, oh my God. And you know how much I love Weinberg. So you should, I'll show you that GSW. And so that theory is an SU2 gauge theory. Yang Mills did not write down that theory. They were just trying to come up with a general SU2 See, that, that just goes, that you can have a variety of options, doesn't mean to actually describe nature. So the weak interaction is an SU2 gauge theory, and the full standard model is SU3 cross SU2 cross U1, which hopefully Johnson has told you what the crosses mean. If not, I'll tell him to tell you. Okay. Rohan, Johnson is our guy who's teaching the math, so he's been doing a group theory uh, tour. So, okay. Okay, so let's figure out what Yang and Mills were doing. But let's just keep this in the back of our mind that all the fundamental interactions are generated with gauge symmetries, right? Is that starting to become clear? Okay. Man, honestly, it's, it, it, it gets you, this is, this is good. I mean, it didn't have to work like this. So that's why it's always very, very nice. Okay, so what did Yang and Mills, what was the question they asked themselves? They said, we want to, we want to, we want to describe a theory that's SU2 locally gauge invariant with two spin one half fields. Now, immediately you should say, oh, this doesn't make sense because there's no physical theory with two spin one half fields coupled to one another. It's not a thing. Okay, so this, this is, but I'm gonna show you what they actually wrote. I'm not just gonna skip because most classes just skip to SU3 and cut out what they actually try. So I think this will be an instructive calculation and that will be what we'll do for the rest of the class. Okay, so let's write down the free Lagrangian. The free Lagrangian is really simple. It's just two Dirac Lagrangians. It's just two Dirac Lagrangians, I, psi one, psi bar, psi one, gamma mu, d mu. 
uh, bar one. So now I'm just labeling one and two. So one will be the label for the first fermion. And two will be the, let me put the bar here. That's what I've been doing. Minus M psi bar one psi one. Plus, and now, wow, it's not very fancy. Psi bar two, gamma mu d mu psi two. Okay, that's what Yang and Mills did. And you remember that now psi, now psi, we write down, let's just write down psi like this. So psi will be now, psi is always a four component column uh, vector, right? But now it's a function of two fermion fields. Each fermion field has four components, right? And we can write them out as wild spinners and all that jazz. Okay, and then the adjoint psi bar, just the permission conjugate. The row vector. And so if I define, and these are four components each, you could have used the notation where you could have had like psi alpha i, where alpha runs from one to two and i goes from one to four. But I won't use that notation. That's just a hammer in. So if I do it that way, then we can write down the Lagrangian as i psi, just our, sorry, psi bar gamma mu d mu psi minus m psi psi bar, psi bar psi. And we'll, we'll turn this m into a capital M and we'll call this the mass matrix. So now m is just m1, 0, 0, m2. Okay, this is just to put everything into one equation. Okay, let's just say that they're equal mass. So then we just get this, okay? So now we have two equal mass fermions. This is what Yang and Mills did. Okay, and the basic, the basic thing is that there's no such thing as two spin one half fields with equal mass coupling to one another in nature. So this is not physical, but they did it anyway because if it's beauty. Okay, so now let's work out uh, the principles of this, but let's be a little cautious because now we're not gonna have e to the i theta. We're gonna have some two by two unitary matrix with determinant one that's gonna be responsible for the transformations, right? That's the definition of SU2, yes? So now psi, we'll go to some unitary transformation u psi. Fine. Again, u dagger u is equal to one. Fine. Okay, and psi bar, the adjoint, goes to psi bar u dagger. That's fine as well. But now what is the unitary transformation? Well, now it's some e to the i h, where h is some two by two Hermitian matrix. I.e. that h dagger equals h. So this is her, a Hermitian matrix, right? Otherwise it's not unitary. What's the most famous collection of SU2 matrices? Go back to problem set two. The poly matrices. Yeah, good. Excellent. So you know they're going to come into the story. Very good. Okay, so let's, the, we have a very good expression for any general two by two permission matrix. So let's write that, write that down. But you're right, the, poly, the spin matrices are the sort of simplest S22 representation. You may recall in lecture two of quantum mechanics over a year ago, one of the problems was derive one of the Pauling spin matrices from all of the principles of SU2, all of the group sort of characteristics. So I can write down any general Hermitian matrix in the following way. 
So remember, all matrices come from just exponentiation, exponentiations of operators. That's how you can get any kind of matrix. That actually is what we're going to talk about a lot with this QCD kind of thing. Because we know that even in quantum mechanics, remember we talked about angular momentum, you know that symmetries, sorry, symmetries generate conservation laws, even in quantum mechanics. So this comes from this idea of continuous symmetries. So I can write down any Hermitian matrix in the following, theta times one, where one is the identity matrix, plus what? Plus tau dot A, where tau are the SU2, the Pauli spin matrices, and A is some number. Okay, so this is the general way I can write down any two by two Hermitian matrix. Okay. A is some number, tau is the spin matrix, one is the ID, theta is the phase. Okay. Okay, so now the unitary transformation becomes u e to the i theta times e to the i what? Or e to the nut i, but yes, e to the i what? e to the i tau dot a, right? Just based on what I just wrote down. That's what this Hermitian matrix becomes. So we've already, so basically what, what you should be, what you should be, uh, you should be intuitively saying this. This is already what we looked at. This is the U1 piece, right? And then this is the new piece from SU2. So let's focus on this because the U1 piece isn't important in this scenario. Okay, so basically we have psi going to uh, e to the i tau dot a of psi. So this is a global SU2 transformation. Okay, so now I have lambda of x again. I like using this. It's a good way to define our parameters. And I'll define this as minus. I won't forget the minus now. Minus one over q a of x. Okay. Where q now is some coupling. It's not the charge, it's some coupling now, right? Because charge is, charge is the coupling in QED, right? E is the coupling. But now you can have any coupling, right? In non-abelian gauge theory, we have G, alpha, any coupling you want. So how can we write this down? So first of all, let's just write down the local SU2 transformation. So psi goes to some S times psi. Right, where S now equals E to the minus I Q tau dot lambda. Yes, that's the local SU2 transformation. And so now again, if we take the derivative of psi, we have a problem, right? Because now we're going to get that gauge redundancy. Not, sorry, we're not going to get the gauge redundancy from this. The gauge redundancy comes from the covariant derivative, that extra term. This is just because of the fact that now this depends on x. This is a different kind of problem. And this just gives us some s d mu psi plus, I don't know, Plus d mu s psi. Okay. Now I'll define the covariant derivative again to solve this problem. As d mu plus i q tau dot a mu. Okay, and that should solve. And you should check all of this, right? You should work it out. To work out the terms, make sure this covariant derivative solves the problem and leaves the Lagrangian invariant. And again, therefore, d mu psi goes to s d mu psi. Okay. 
So that's the whole. Okay. But now the question becomes, what is the transformation rule for A? Because it's obviously going to have a different transformation rule for SU2. That's the question, right? Because now this stuff was kind of trivial. You just, we know the properties of SU2, you write it down, you kind of, not really a big deal. Now we want the transformation law for A and then we're done. That gives us the whole story. So let's figure that out. And we're gonna to have to write out the free term for A in SU2. In a manifestly gauge invariant way, basically. Okay, any questions so far or is everyone okay? Okay, good, okay. okay. So how do we want to do this? So let's say I let a mu now transform to some a mu prime. Okay. And now the goal is we want to figure out the transformation rule. So now I have tau dot a mu prime. So now if I take this guy right, and I just work this out, I get s tau dot a mu, and you can check this, times s to the minus one. Well, not really. Uh, it should be obvious that this is okay to do. Plus i over q. Wait a second. Plus i over q, if I'm taking that. Hold on, hold on. Yes. d mu s, s to the minus one. So that's how this guy is going to work itself out. Hold on, did I miss a term? Wait, where from i divided by q came from? Yeah, that's what I want to make sure I did right. <laughs> do you... Actually, let's hold off on this. We might need this. Ah, yes. Yes, 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 yes. It comes from this derivative on S. You're going to get an I over Q factor. How did I define S? Can someone remind me how I defined it S? <laughs> it was like, oh, yeah, it was E to the minus IQ tau dot lambda. Yeah, so yeah, good. Yeah, never mind. Yeah, it comes from that. I get confused with defining. Oh, before, let me just make one thing explicitly clear. Remember, the transformation is a U1 transformation, the full, I just want to write down the full, times the SU2 transformation. This is actually the group U2. Okay, I just like just so you have your it's u one cross s u two just so you have the group theory language kind of I just remember that okay, so now let's set the magnitude of lambda to be much less than one. which allows me to write down S in the following way. But I'm gonna use a Taylor expansion now, just saying. So I can write this now as a Taylor series that goes one minus I Q tau dot lambda. Just, or actually, yeah, kind of. And S minus one can now be approximated as well. If I let lambda be very tiny, that's the thing. to one plus IQ tau dot lambda, okay.
and then d mu of s can now be approximated in the following way minus i q tau dot d mu lambda. Okay, so now I'm going to write down this dot product using all of these guys. Okay, so let me know when I can erase and I'll write that down. Yeah, I can erase. Yes. Okay. Okay, so let's write down this guy again. So you can see why I'm doing this. It's not exactly clear my motivation, but can keep uh, plowing through. So tau dot a prime mu. Now with all of these definitions, you can kind of work it out. So I'll just put the approximation sign. It's not the exact thing. It is let me think tau dot a mu plus i q. What's going to be left? So I'm going to get a commutator, tau dot a mu, tau dot lambda. Or wait, <laughs> wait a second. Let me think. Plus tau dot d mu lambda. I think this is right, but check, you know, check me. I think that's right. I think you do get a commutator. And a prime mu. Now we can write down an approximation for a prime mu in this sort of, uh, because I, all I've done is I've approximated the uh, SU2 symmetry. So now a prime mu goes to a mu plus d mu lambda. That's the standard thing, but since I'm working in this approximation space, I get plus two q lambda a mu. That should be right, but check that. Out. All of this should tell you that now the transformation rule for a mu and s 2 is not trivial because you get this extra 2q lambda a mu term that you have to deal with. This should start to look familiar because remember in QCD, the field strength tensor is, sorry, not the, yeah. Yeah, the field strength tensor has a term that goes i over q commutator a mu a mu. And that comes exactly because of this reason, because you have this 2q lambda a mu term that you have to get rid of. So that's why the full Lagrangian is just going to have another extra term. And so much garbage we have to file out. Okay, so now we've written down the new transformation rule for uh, SU2. Okay, and so basically what we can write down now is that F mu nu goes to F mu nu plus 2q. Because now we're going to get that extra residual term lambda times f mu. Nu. I don't even need the times, but okay. Very good. So let's write down the Yang Mills Lagrangian now, the gauge fixed. Lagrangian. This is not going to look like what you may remember. So it's just I psi bar gamma mu d mu psi. Sorry, minus m psi bar psi. 
by the way, remember, this is for two spin one half fermions, right? We define everything in kind of two massless spin one half fermions. Uh, minus one over 16 pi, f mu nu, f mu nu. But now, remember, f mu nu now itself is going to transform in a strange way. So we better gauge fix that. Or actually, we've kind of implicitly done that by writing down the transformation law already. And then this is just minus q psi bar. What's the interaction term? Psi bar uh, gamma mu tau psi. Uh, yeah, that's good. And of course, it's coupled to the vector field, in massless vector field. So it's still massless. So you may recall that the Yang Mills Lagrangian you usually start with, the free one is just one over 16 pi. F mu nu, F mu nu, right? This is like what you see in any kind of discussion. And so this is a non-abelian gauge theory because what we'll find is that all of the generators SU2 and SU3 generators don't commute. You see, it's very similar. In quantum mechanics, you have generators, right? That's what I was trying to say earlier. The group generators generate what? They generate the conservation laws, right? And the group generators generate the symmetry, right? So, Similarly here, the generators will generate all of this stuff from the group structure, but the generators themselves are, don't commute. That's sort of a trivial point, who cares? That just means the groups are non-abelian, i.e. non-abelian gauge theory. This was pretty useless for like 20 years, no, 10 years. But people thought figuring out the dynamics of the strong interaction was gonna be very difficult. And this really fast forwarded that, this really fast forwarded that, because now you can, it seemingly is magic. You impose some symmetry and you get what you want. Okay, that didn't necessarily have to work out like that. So next time we're gonna start looking at, not some basics of QED, but next time we're gonna do the renormalization group. And I'm, we're going to take a huge detour again. And I'm going to work out something called the beta function for you. So if you want to do some reading, next time I'm going to work out the beta function. OK. OK, great. So we have a rare uh, occurrence. I'll stop recording. We have a rare occurrence in the class 